actually talking about anti-aging, life extension, any of those topics, as much as I love those topics. Because for me, at the end of the day, the reason I like talking about health and nutrition is it means there's more time, and more time to do all the awesome things that I like to do. I really like the last talk. Mitch is a good friend of mine, and I'm definitely a fan of travel, hacking, etc. So today, I'm really going to talk about how to enable and do more of that. In other words, how do we travel more, but pay less? So a little bit more about me. Who am I? Well, I'm definitely a hacker. I've been in the computer security industry pretty much as long as I can remember. Fingers are permanently curved inwards. I'm a bit of a conference addict. I think in 2012, I went to something like 26 conferences. And I'm pretty sure I hit more in 2013. But really, I'm a nomad. And now this may surprise you guys, but I counted it out. I did the math a little while ago. And in the last three years, I haven't spent more than 11 days in a row in any one city. It's basically, I go, oh great, it's 11 days. If I stay here too long, I may spontaneously combust. Time to go travel and hit the next city. And with that much travel, I've definitely discovered more than a few tricks along the way. Next. But before we start talking any of this, let's talk about some of the upsides and the downsides. Upsides, definitely a lot more travel, and a lot more travel at discounted rates. But there can be a trap. To me, it's almost like playing a video game. You start getting interested, you start going, how do I optimize every facet? And it becomes a game. After some point in time, you start realizing that, guess what? You can be spending more time on figuring out the game than the actual travel and benefits you accrue. So keep in mind those hidden costs. So when you start getting into this, it's figure out what are your goals and why you're getting into it. Is my goal, hey, I want to be able to travel whenever I want? What does that look like? Does that mean I want to go on a crazy round the world plane trip, visit all these far off mystical lands I've heard of? Or does it just mean, hey, I'm in a long distance relationship and I want to figure out how to make New York to San Francisco every other weekend work? Figure that out so you can target what you're doing accordingly. And yes, for this speech, I'm mostly talking about those of us that are lucky enough to be in the US and have decent credit. That's not to say some of these tricks can't apply to other people, but just for the most part, most of the chips and tricks that you can actually utilize, you need to have one of those too. So let's start talking credit cards. Credit cards can be wonderful. Credit cards mean I don't have to carry around large sums of money as I'm traveling about. But really when we start getting in this, there's three types of credit cards. So when you're looking for a credit card sign up, keep that in mind. The first type, Simple, it's the credit cards that you sign up for the sign up bonus. This is basically free money. You'll see this all of the time. Chase or Citibank will say, hey, by the way, Jolly, guess what, we like you, we want you to spend money. If you sign up for our credit card, we'll give you 50, we'll give you 100,000 miles. In exchange for a few little minor details, you've gotta put some amount of credit card spend on it. And for most people, this is actually where you'll get the most amount of benefit. I'd say in, in any given year, I'm probably clearing about two to $3,000 in free travel just by signing up for a credit card that I wouldn't have otherwise used. And this is absolutely amazing. Think about your day-to-day -day spend. Think about the day-to-day -day things that you're otherwise going to buy just by shifting, oh, rather than buying it on one type of credit card, I buy it on the other. You suddenly now get a lot of free travel. Now, there are downsides to this. One, going back to that good credit. This is really geared for people that are paying off their bills in full every single month. I highly suggest the second you get that nice shiny new credit card, you sign up for it, you make a note and set up and sign up for auto pay. So that way every month it's paid off in full, paid off in full and paid off in full. Because face it, free credit card and free air for is great, but if you're off on a beach someplace and forget to pay your bill, suddenly all that extra free travel, extra free money you basically got rapidly goes away. The other downside is meeting that spend. In order to say, uh, I think one of the most recent offers I saw was for American Airlines. You basically got about 75,000 miles in exchange for 
$10,000 of spend in the first three months. Downside is that can be a lot of spend, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. The second type of credit cards are the ones that we sign up for the benefits that you get for holding the credit card. Airline credit cards are the best example of this. Usually they'll do something like, guess what? If you sign up for my credit card, you get free priority boarding, you get free bags checked. Can be very valuable. Some of the other benefits for some of them will even include things like a free companion pass or a free com uh, companion flight ticket for $100 or less. But this will really depend on the card. Your third type of cards are what I call your daily driver cards. These are the ones that outside of when you're trying to meet a credit card sign up bonus that you put your credit card spend on. And these are the ones that are usually the ones that will give you a benefit on some category of spending. For example, if any of you have gone out and grabbed food with me, I'll always pull out my Citibank forward card. The reason is, right now, that gives me effectively 5% cash back on that meal on that restaurant. That adds up. When I'm buying stuff from Amazon, I'm getting 5%. When I'm buying plane tickets, I'm getting 5%. And 5% versus your 1% or 2% that you get from a normal card, that's a significant advantage. A brief detour into cash back versus mileage cards. This is when I started talking about it's important to understand your goals. I'd argue for most people that aren't crazy nomads and aren't constantly jumping on planes, actually doing airline credit cards isn't the best way to go other than getting those massive sign-up bonuses. The reason is, for most people, if you look across the board, you can usually get a cashback card that'll give you probably about 2% cashback on everything you spend. And 2% cashback on everything you spend often ends up being more useful for more people than the one mile that you'd get for getting a mileage-based credit card. To be honest, my parents drive me nuts on this. They put so much money onto American Airlines card, and I know they'd do better off getting a 2% cash back card like Fidelity or Priceline. And that's really what we talk about when we talk about valuing mileage. The best bang for your buck is generally for high expensive international first class and business class flights. You can often have your miles valued at somewhere between five or even 10 cents a mile which is unheard of, but on the other hand, you have to do the math. After all, would you actually be buying and shelling out that money for an international first or business class flight? If not, it may not actually be worth those five or 10 cents a mile to you. Because of that, you'll often see a lot of people just spend their miles domestically, which isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing, but you do get less value for the dollar. To me, I usually end up my valuing most airline miles at about 1.5 cents a mile, but it really depends. Uh, Delta, for example, Sky Pesos tend to be worth a lot less, some are worth a lot more. Tracking mileage balances. When you start getting in this, you start being like me and having a huge list of mileage accounts across the board. Tracking that ends up being very important. If you sign up for a great credit card, but those miles are expiring in two years and you don't take advantage of them, you've lost all of your upside. I tend to use both Award Wallet and TripBit Pro. Award Wallet is really the premier mileage and point tracking site out there. I pay for the Pro subscription. It lets me track not only how many miles I have, when they expire, it gives me alerts. TripBit Pro, I really use more of for my travel planning. So any time you're traveling, if I've got a flight detail, a hotel detail, etc., I forward it on. They keep track of all of that, but their pro subscription also tracks mileage balances. Picking an airline alliance. For the most part, this isn't going to matter for most people. And it'll really depend on how many miles are you flying in a given year. For the most part, you only start getting frequent flyer benefits when you start hitting about 25,000 miles in a given year. That's usually lowest tier status. There are some certain tricks about this. If you're, say, flying Star Alliance a lot, you can sign up for a G and et cetera. But part of what goes into picking your alliance will depend on, once again, where you're flying and what benefits you want. Are you primarily looking at, hey, you know what, I want to sit back in first class, like I want to sit, sprawl, get a lot of room, that's one thing. 
Or say on the other hand, if I fly domestic all the time and I've got a partner, Southwest has the best frequent flyer benefit domestically in the book. If you hit 100,000 miles with Southwest, you get a companion pass, which means for a year, a person you pick gets to fly anywhere with you domestically for free. Can be pretty fantastic. Now let's start talking about things that might help not just the travelers out there, but pretty much everyone. It's amazing to me how much benefit you can get by stacking programs together. And the first one on my list is getting discounted credit cards. Or sorry, discounted gift cards. I'll do this all the time. You know, I like going, say, to Express, get a nice new shirt. And sure, they're fantastic and they're running the latest 40% off sale. But I'm pretty greedy and I want to do one step better. So I go out on the internet and I realize that there's these places which sell me discounted gift cards where I can buy a discounted gift card and save some maybe five, maybe 20%. So buying the same things I want to buy, just saving a couple percent on that, and of course buying it with a cash back or airline mileage credit card. And then I go one step further. Rather than just buying that gift, discounted gift card directly, I buy it via a cash back portal. And there's a number of them out there. I like top cash back, it's reliable, generally has the best percentage. The two on the bottom, or uh, cash back holics, will end up actually doing a meta search and search all the general cash back portals out there. And it means I go, okay, I'm gonna buy this shirt from Express, I've now got my discounted gift card, I bought it going through this portal, and I can go double dip. I'll go turn around and buy that, once again, going through that cash back portal. And that's really where stacking comes in. So oftentimes, by the time I'm done, I've saved maybe 20, 30% off what I'm actually looking to buy. Because I picked my target, I found all the discounted codes out there using things like Retail Me Not, bought a discounted gift card by going through a cashback portal, so I get like 2% off of that, save the money in the discounted gift card, and then turn around and use that discounted gift card, going back once again through that cashback portal applying the final discount. So at the end of the day, I'm saving 20, 30% on a lot of purchases. And it'll really depend on the purchase. Clothing, you can usually save a lot more. If it's like Amazon, good luck, you'll save maybe five to 7% by the time you're done. But at the end of the day, that's free money. And better yet, that's free after-tax money. Manufacturing spend. This is how you meet some of those big credit card sign-up bonuses. Some of those ones that require you to put $10,000 in three months, unless you're a consultant, unless you can get an employer to pay for a lot of that, this can be a pretty hard. So there's a lot of trips and tips that you can end up using to do this. One of those is buying gift cards ahead of time. There are other things as well, like Amazon payments will let me send up to $1,000 to anyone any month funded with a credit card. You can even use this for charity. I give a lot of money on Kiva. Part of it is because I like helping people. Part of it is also because by helping people, I'm either getting something like 5% cash back to give people in third world countries loans, or I'm using it to meet more sign-up bonuses. It's basically a short-term loan. Eventually, I get my money back. I get my sign-up bonus. People in third world countries get to go build a well, create entrepreneurship jobs. Everyone wins except for may it be the credit card companies. There's also a lot of advanced trips and tips I haven't really covered. Uh, things like hidden city targeting, you can do forcing stopovers, round the world plane tickets. This starts really getting into how do you accrue the most value. The hidden city targeting or ticketing is one thing I'll use a lot, especially for me, I'm often flying one way. So I'll go, oh, okay, I'm in San Francisco, I wanna go to Chicago. Rather than actually searching for a flight directly to Chicago, I basically search for a flight for all of the f airports that are around Chicago that have a stopover in Chicago. And because of how airline tickets are priced, often I'll save 20, 30, 50 dollars by not flying directly to Chicago, not checking a bag, just getting off on the airport in Chicago and going to where I want. It's also one of the things you can do to force a stopover. For example, I wanted to visit some friends in Austin. I was out in New York, but I also really wanted to stop by and see my family in Chicago. 
found a plane ticket to Austin via Chicago, got off in Chicago, sat in the airport lounge, conveniently missed my flight to Austin. You know, oh no, I fell asleep. I was on a business call, walked up and went, hey, by the way, I was flying, you know, I missed my flight, and they rebooked me the next day. There's this little rule which airlines don't generally publish, and it's the stopover, or it's the unofficial like flat tire rule. And basically what that means is, say you know you're gonna miss your flight, show up to the airport anyways. As long as you usually show up between an hour or two of your scheduled departure, they'll book you on the next flight, and you can tell them, hey, no, you know what, let's put me on the next day flight for free. And I've used this all the time. The downside is, you know, my friends will say, hey, Jolly, by the way, you know you don't actually have to get on that flight. And I go, crap, you're right, I actually don't have to get on that flight, and the next thing you know, I'm hanging and getting out in San Francisco for another day. So I know I've gone pretty fast. Bunch of resources. A lot of my info is sourced from Flyer Talk. I've spent way too much time on there. And the bottom three are different blogs. But at this point, we've really got a couple of minutes of questions. I know I've gone pretty fast. I tried to give a big overview. So if anyone's got any questions, talk to me now or find me later one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Joe, I'm a So you're talking about this primarily in the context of travel, but when you were just talking about with, uh, with micro loans that, that eventually get paid back, ideally, uh, that you, you can then fund the cash back. I mean, even if you weren't traveling at all, that sounds like a, a essentially a higher, a relatively good interest, stable investment, possibly, or, or do the loans oftentimes not get paid back? Or what would you do? So to me, you're right. A lot of these tricks you can do without ever flying at all. One of the things I do is I'll sit at home and sell people discounted plane tickets just using my own trips and tips. But for Kiva specifically, I haven't had a loan default on me yet. I've run probably somewhere between five and $7,000 in Kiva over the years. Um, US Bank uh, Flex Cash Plus card, one of the credit card bonus categories is charitable spending. So I make 5% on that Kiva loan. Definitely, it's sure it's low amount and you're only making 5%, but on the other hand, you're making 5% without too much risk. One of the tips I'll do for that is I'll pick loans that have a shorter loan term, so they'll pay it back in eight or 12 months, and it's a pretty good return on investment for sure without ever leaving. Uh, one of the other tips for Kiva specifically is there's a website called Kiva Lens, which will let you in bulk make loans based on what your parameters are. So I go, okay, I want ones that aren't that risky, where the partner has a good reputation, and then mass fund loans whenever I feel like it. Other questions? So there's a lot of one. That one's uh, specifically the, looking in my, I'm pretty sure that's the cash, yeah. It's the US Bank Cash Plus card, that one. And there's tons of specifics. If you want to talk specifically which cards I have in my wallet or which cards you'd use for massive sign-up bonuses, et cetera, drop me a line, come up and talk to me. Uh, the one I'd like for most people, uh, there's a Fidelity cashback card that basically gives you 2% on everything if you deposit it straight to a Fidelity um, investment account. And that's usually one of the daily driver cards I'll recommend for most people. Otherwise, Chase tends to have a lot of good ones. Uh, the Sapphire one tends to be pretty nice as far as some of the sign-up bonuses and categories. But for most people, you're really going to get most out of the sign-up bonuses. The other one is Barclays right now has, I forget the name of it, but it basically effectively gives you 2.2% cash back across the board and currently has like a 400000 or sorry, a 40,000 mile sign-up bonus, which basically ends up being something like $500 in free travel. Other questions? Jill? The, uh, the, the cards with annual bonuses, uh, sorry, the, um, the, annual the annual fees? Yes, so I definitely sign up for the ones with the annual fees, and the reason is they usually have the best sign-up bonuses. But what you do is you sign up, you put a note, for eight months before, or sorry, eight months after you sign up, at that point you call up the card company and go, hey, you know what, I've got all these credit cards, I'm not really putting much spend on here, like, I think I'm gonna cancel. At which point they usually give you a nice offer and it's usually worth more than the aisles and the fees itself. 
I think with that, we're out of time. So if anyone has any other questions, find me later.